an amazing storyteller. That kind of openness that I'm trying to, that I've been rather clumsily trying to describe. He's very, 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 very good at it. Hey, what's up, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Accolades Conversation Series, in which I talk to some of my favorite artists about who or what they would recommend me checking out. Make sure to subscribe to our channel or hit that like button. This episode is in collaboration with Sonic City Festival, a three-day curated festival in Kortrijk, Belgium, from the 11th till the 13th of November, organized by Wilde Westen. This year's edition is curated by Low, Black Country New Road, and Gilla Band. Some other bands already added to the lineup are Goat, Dry Clean, Coco Co, La Fide et Le Gadat, and the musician you'll hear me talk to, Kieran Leonard. Check out the lineup on soniccity.be, where more names will be added soon. Kieran Leonard is a musician, composer, and singer-songwriter from Saddleworth, Greater Manchester. He first learned to play mandolin and guitar, and then, inspired by his older brother's diverse music collection, began to experiment with composing electronic music. After a period of prolifically self-releasing experimental music, Leonard's full-length album, Bowler Hat Soup, was released in 2012 on Hand of Glory Records to some acclaim, receiving notable endorsement from DJ Mark Riley of BBC Radio 6 Music. His subsequent LP, Grapefruit, released on Moshi Moshi Records, likewise received critical acclaim. I spoke to Karen about John Berger, an English art critic, novelist, painter and poet. His novel G won the 1972 Booker Prize and his essay on art criticism, Ways of Seeing, written as an accompaniment to the BBC series of the same name, was influential. He lived in France for over 50 years. John Berger began his career as a painter and exhibited works at a number of London galleries in the late 1940s. His art has been shown at the Wildenstein, Redfern and Leicester galleries in London. Berger taught drawing at St. Mary's Teacher Training College. He later became an art critic, published many essays and reviews in New Statesman. His Marxist humanism and his strongly stated opinions on modern art combined make him a controversial figure early in his career. As a statement of political commitment, he titled an early collection of essays Permanent Red. Berger was never a formal member of the Communist Party of Great Britain. Rather, he was a close associate of it and its front, the Artist International Association, AIA, until the latter disappeared in 1953. He was active in the Geneva Club, a discussion group that appears to have overlapped with the British communist circles in the 1950s. If you are into my illustrations, this accolade series comes as an illustration book, which you can still get on our website, createrecords.be. This is what Kieran had to add. Oh yeah, yeah, I'd like to talk about John Berger, but it's kind of funny, I think an interesting starting point, I remember reading an article about it once that pointed out, if you go on John Berger's Wikipedia page, and in the bibliography section at the bottom, there's like a section for novels. He wrote like five or six novels. He wrote a couple of screenplays, a few collections of poetry. And then the other section is, is about 80 publications long. It's an enormous, an enormous uh, body of work, um, most of which falls outside of easy categorization. Not only because a lot of the work is collaborative, um, he would work with other writers and photographers and, and filmmakers and things like that. Um, but also because he blends fiction with non-fiction and poetry and things like this uh, so well. I think the reason that his work is able to be so pluralistic, but also very, very consistent is because I think there's a rare kind of, as I say, consistency um, structure going through all of his different concerns. So. John Berger is primarily famous as an art critic and he's primarily famous for a television show and a book, a television show that was made for the BBC in the 1970s called Ways of Seeing, um, which is how I first became loosely aware of him. Um, I think internationally it's very well known, but especially in Britain, if you do a, if you do an arts or humanities degree in Britain, you are expected to have a, it's a, it's a very sort of seminal book. Uh, and the book was largely prepared in response to a television show that was made in the BBC, for the BBC in the 1960s called Civilization uh, by a man called Kenneth Clark. Kenneth Clark was a you know he was a, he was he was a good he was a good uh, uh, art writer and, uh, and, a, and a smart man, but he was very much Civilization is about the canon, and it's a very it's a very conservative sort of almost quite distant view of 
art and how you look at art and engage with art and evaluate it. It's conservative, you know, the, the, the word really to focus on is conservative. And what Ways of Seeing was about, well, it's about many things. It's kind of difficult, and even though it's such a f- famous text, it's quite hard to it's quite hard to summarize. But it's largely a response to that attitude towards art, which I suppose Berger would see as mystifying. Above all, he uses the word mystification a lot. Uh, but this kind of uh, engagement with this quasi sort of like religious idolization of art leads to a kind of mystification that means that we don't engage with it in a very direct sort of a subjective way. For example, one of the key concepts uh, in that series, which Berger is credited with popularizing, is the idea of the male gaze. Kenneth Clark, uh, in addition to being the host of Civilization, was kind of a nationally renowned expert on the nude, uh, you know, the classical nude painting, and he would write you know, this dross about, you know, nudes and how they depicted uh, the, the feminine beauty ideal. And then Burge's response was, take it for granted how obvious it is that those that those paintings, and they're about possession rather than, than beauty. Uh, yeah, so, so, so Ways way of Seeing is basically about that. More importantly, and this is sort of getting to the point of why I think he's important, Ways of Seeing is ultimately about valuing subjective engagement with art in contrast to mystification and received wisdom from the canon. I mean, he's not, he's not often described as a postmodernist or a post-structuralist, and I don't think it's necessarily, it's a bit of a limiting framework to put him in, but I think he's a very useful riposte to the kind of very prevalent right-wing argument that we live in a I fucking hate this word, but it's useful that we live in a kind of era of kind of post-truth because of the evaluation on subjectivity in how we think about the world. But I think what John Berger shows is that subjectivity is often just about context and openness and empathy, basically. And in a way, ways of seeing is about learning how to be a better seer, how to be a better viewer, become more aware of the way that you engage with things, get more joy out of what you're viewing as a result of becoming more aware of them. And crucially, I think he shows us that if you become more aware of this and teach yourself to perceive things in this way and the different forces that kind of engineer how we engage with things like that, it becomes easier to engage with others and empathize with other perspectives. Mm -hmm. So I think basically to summarize it, what I think ways of seeing teaches us this almost like post-structural subjectivity doesn't lead to narcissism and it doesn't lead to the death of truth. Uh, It actually leads to something less mystified, more direct and ultimately more open. And so in that sense, his writing about art directly connects he also wrote a lot about migration and other and other political issues. And Would you see him instead of like being a, a writer, more like a philosopher than in, in that way? There's no yeah the, the, yeah. the board has completely uh, ceased to cease to exist. I think he's more a critic than a philosopher. I think his thought is is mostly engaging with. I suppose philosophers do that as well. I suppose yeah. I suppose he does get pretty abstract. But his main his main vocation was as a critic, an art critic. Yeah. And, and and so the the television show that you're talking about, in what way should I? I think the book has slightly more information in it, but the TV show is in four parts. Uh, first part is about reproduction, art in the age of mechanical reproduction, and how that impacts our connection with art. If <laughs> paintings can be mass produced, and you know how it leads to the fact that we can use perhaps that we could use images like words is a nice like phrase in the in the in the TV series dialogue kind of like engagement with art rather than a canonical like received wisdom and there's a, there's other episodes about art as a commodity like the landscape as a as a, as a commodity as a uh, as it's quite it's quite common um where sort of landscape paintings that people like kenneth clark would talk about being uh, demonstrating a beautiful landscape it's as common for a landscape to be painted to have been commissioned so that the patron could show off how many fields they owned rather than the beauty of the land itself. He talks about a Gainsborough painting in that context. So that's one aspect to it, sort of showing the other forces other than beauty, you know. Oh, uh, okay, uh, gotcha. But it's also about, he does a lot of fun stuff where he sort of talks about Caravaggio paintings with kids and shows how 
children sometimes engage with paintings on a they can sometimes get to the heart of a painting more easily than an art critic you know uh, if you're able to just kind of engage with it as in, as in like a rational towards emotional kind of way of like kind of the, the, it's it's really interesting that's in the first episode and uh, and the example is that they're, they're all looking at a painting a caravaggio painting of christ and the kids can't decide whether the person in the middle who they think might be jesus but they don't know they can't decide whether it's a man or a woman which is interesting um because given caravaggio's homosexuality he would often paint very androgynous figures which a more kind of stuffy art critic who obviously knows that it's Christ and it's obviously a male Christ wouldn't have thought about. Um, but because children don't know anything about that, they actually get to a very, a very interesting subtext of the painting more quickly than like, than Kenneth Clark would. Is he a person who, who uh, got respect in that world? Yeah, very much so. Very much so. Everyone loves yeah. him. I don't know anyone who doesn't, I don't know how he couldn't, you know, but he didn't, he also didn't, but he also didn't like caught that kind of, like he made, he made that show for the BBC, which was very popular and then didn't, make a lot of television after that mm -hmm. he went to live in france in the 1960s and he lived in rural france for the 1970s with uh what to me hilariously he calls the peasants he talks about peasant life a lot i mean to me peasant in english is is quite pejorative but i think he uses it deliberately as a way to try and reclaim it in a way as a description of a very specific kind of life and not a not an not an inferior kind of life um but yeah so he was he's 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 very internationally well respected um but didn't court the popularity of a public intellectual even though he certainly could have he's an incredibly magnetic screen presence of an amazing storyteller that kind of openness that i'm trying to i've been rather clumsily trying to describe he's very 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 good at it yeah uh, like you asked before whether I would describe him as a philosopher. I don't think I would or he would, but I think the strands between his art criticism and his political writing about migration or about the peasantry in France all point towards a general sort of, a very, very kind of radical empathy and and, and, mm -hmm. and warmth. The, the, the reason why you give him accolades must be because he like had, had like a, you know like a certain impact on what you are who you are as a person and maybe that that's something that you take away in your music like it, I know of course it's not like a, think, a direct a direct thing you know no no but I think I think it's an interesting question though like the way to which you were uh, if you can like weigh in your hands how much a person impacts your mm -hmm. work and it's very difficult to say especially when you're talking about someone who works in another medium like I don't I don't write poetry or prose or criticism so it's hard to say that in a direct sense um but i just think there are particular you know ways of seeing as the as the as the book is called that artists of any medium mm -hmm. are able to transmit that that fundamentally change you in a way that, that's difficult to quantify kind of answered it with the uh, with uh, saying the book and the and the, the tv series but what would be the first thing that people should look into when it comes to his work? I think it's a really good introduction, Ways of Seeing. In addition to being his, like, by far his most famous book, I think it gives a sense for... Because it is a work about criticism, but there is also a lot of politics in it as well. So I think it, I think it connects the strands in his very like, vast body of work quite well. My favourite book of his is a book uh, called The Seventh Man, um, which he... It's one of many books he made in collaboration with a Swiss photographer called Jean Moore. Um, and that book is about the experience of kind of migrant laborers from Switzerland and Germany. Mm -hmm. And the uh, nationality of the laborers is usually, I think, Turkish or Greek. That's an amazing, amazing book. I think that's his best book that I, that I know of. It was completely groundbreaking when it came out. In, in, in a certain way, it's hard to appreciate because sometimes the things that he is saying seem obvious in 2022. And one of those pieces, again, where it's in the other section on Wikipedia, you know, not just because of the interplay between the photography and the text, but because he sort of drifts between very factual, very political writing about basically, basically about how laborers from these countries are exploited with very, very, very personal stories. 
worth looking into. Uh, yeah, so um, yeah, uh, the other question that I, that I had was, uh, uh, so you're playing at Sonic City Festival. Um, did you see the lineup of uh, people that are playing? I kind of have. Yeah, yeah. Is there, I, is there anything? Is there anything in particular that you look forward to to seeing? Or I, I definitely, um, I'm definitely looking forward to seeing Low again. I've seen them before. But we're definitely going to see Luzberg. Who I think who were um, they're Dutch. I think they're not Belgian. They're Dutch guitar player is amazing. He's like the fucking best guitar player in the world. He's so good. I only saw him once, and like every song, it'd be like three minutes of song, and then four minutes of like a guitar solo with no notes. It was like Mersbo or something. It was amazing. I want to thank Karen Leonard for this conversation. Again, this episode is a collaboration with Sonic City Festival, a three-day curated festival in Kortrijk, Belgium, from the 11th till the 13th of November. This year's edition is curated by Low, Black Country, New Road, and Gillab Band. Make sure to check that out, soniccity.be. Next week, on episode 44, I'm talking to rapper Fat Tony about his love for the music of Devin the Dude. Thanks again for listening. <laughs>